Welcome back to the Path to Happiness, an introduction to the Unification Principle. I'm your host, Dr. Tyler Hendricks. By the lessons of the principle we're seeing in the Bible, we're learning how to live on the foundation of principle, understanding God's time periods, maintaining the strength of a staff, cooperating as mother and son, maintaining our physical purity, and so forth. And we can see a good deal of variety, uh, flexibility, all the way from Jacob's bread and soup, to God's miracle of quail and manna in the desert, to Jesus' own flesh and blood. Study of the course of Moses will, will illustrate more how God's unchanging principles fit with changing situations like ours. As we know, Jacob and his descendants became slaves in Egypt because Abraham failed in his symbolic offering. How did they get there? Joseph, the 11th son of Jacob, was a favorite of his father, and so his older brothers were jealous of him. They sold him as a slave to Egyptian merchants when he was 17. But by the time he was 30, the Pharaoh appointed Joseph prime minister of Egypt based upon his ability to interpret the Pharaoh's dream. Joseph predicted, based on the dream, that there would be seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine. As prime minister, Joseph prepared for the years of famine by building massive warehouses throughout the land and storing the surplus crops during the years of abundance. Tribes near Egypt faced difficulties because of the famine, and they didn't prepare for it. So these tribes included Jacob and his children living in Canaan. They went to buy grain in Egypt, and their reunion with Joseph, whom Jacob thought was dead, is another great foundation of substance. As a result, Jacob's family of 70 immigrated to Egypt and was allowed to live in Goshen, located in the Upper Nile, thanks to Joseph's generosity. That was when Jacob was 130 years old and Joseph was 39 years old, around 1870 B.C. At the outset, the Hebrews farmed and multiplied their numbers. However, as the 18th dynasty of Egypt emerged, pharaohs who had no relation with Joseph came to power. They feared the expansion of the Hebrews and forced them into slavery. It grew worse and worse until when Moses was born, and the Pharaoh ordered midwives to kill male Hebrew babies when they were born. He later ordered the death of all infant boys by drowning, let only, letting only the infant girls live. As one of the descendants of Levi, one of the sons of Jacob, Moses was born as son of Amran, and Amran's wife, Moses' mother, was Jochebed. Before Moses was born, there were his older sister, Miriam, and his three years older brother, Aaron. Jochebed raised Moses secretly for three months, but she couldn't keep this, his existence a secret forever. So she made a little boat and laid Moses in it and put it in a field of reeds on the Nile River, near where the daughter of the Pharaoh bathed. At that time, the Nile River was a holy place to the Egyptian people. The purifying ceremony of bathing in the Nile was conducted with the faith that it would bring longevity and good health. And there were places where only women were allowed to bathe. There was a special place for princesses and women from the palace. Jochebed put the reed box, which Moses was in, at that place. She also had Miriam watch the situation. At that time, the daughter of the Pharaoh and her handmaidens went to that place to bathe, and they happened to hear the crying of the baby Moses. Therefore, Moses was named from the Egyptian word for the person who was pulled from the water. As the Pharaoh's daughter rescued Moses and 
fell in love with him. Moses turned into the one who led the Israelites out of Egypt. And in Hebrew, Moses means the person who leads people across the water, a liberator and savior. Now, when the princess, though, was flustered with a crying baby in her arms, Miriam appeared to tell her, should I call on a nanny among Hebrew women and make her feed this boy for you, your highness? The princess agreed. Miriam brought Moses' natural mother to her and introduced her as Moses' nanny. The princess said, bring this boy and feed him for me. I will pay you. For that reason, Jochebed brought and raised Moses up until he was grown while being paid and brought him back to the princess in the palace. Moses became an adopted son of the princess and lived in the palace. With the help and effort from his wise mother and clever older sister, Moses could save his own life and receive education from the care of his natural mother working as his nanny. Thus, Moses restored through indemnity the foundation of faith on the condition of 40 years in the palace, maintaining his allegiance to the God of his fathers, and fulfilled a dispensation of 40 for the separation of Satan. By Moses' time, the age when symbolic offerings, that is, uh, sacrificial animal offerings and grain, were the objects for the condition to lay the foundation of faith, was coming to a close. A new era was opening, the age when people were able to receive God's word directly. There was no longer any need for a symbolic offering to lay the foundation of faith. Therefore, Moses could restore the foundation of faith upon the completion of the dispensation of 40 for the separation of Satan by upholding God's word in the Pharaoh's palace. As he laid the foundation of faith, he secured the position of the younger brother, Abel, in relation to the older brother, the nation of the Israelites. If they, as an entire nation, had obeyed Moses in faith, inherited God's will from Moses, and multiplied goodness, they would have fulfilled the national indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature and laid the national foundation of substance to receive the Messiah. But how were they to recognize that this prince of Egypt was their younger brother and central figure? God set up a situation to give them a sign. Moses came upon an Egyptian slave driver mistreating one of his brethren. Immediately he killed the Egyptian and he buried him in the sand. God allowed Moses to kill the Egyptian, representing the cruel despotism, to show the Israelites that Moses was their leader and liberator. At that moment, the Israelites getting behind Moses would determine if they could successfully begin the course of liberation and return to the promised land. If the Israelites had followed Moses, God would have brought them directly into the land of Canaan in 21 days. It's not really a long journey. Unfortunately, the Israelites did not rally behind Moses. They did not appreciate what he had done for them. The next day, Moses reprimanded two Israelites for arguing with each other. And they retorted to him, What then? Are you going to kill us too? It means that they didn't trust Moses, and they just considered him a murderer. Moses knew that if the Pharaoh heard of his deed, saving the slave, he would execute him. So Moses had no choice but to flee Egypt into the Midian wilderness. Thus, the national foundation of substance to receive the Messiah could not continue, and God prolonged his providence to a second stage. In that stage, as we shall see, God feared that the unpredictable Israelites 
might turn faithless and return to Egypt without completing their journey. Therefore, God led the people across the Red Sea, a point of no return, and then on a long course through the wilderness. We see that we can turn around really bad situations, like Joseph being sold into slavery, or the government trying to kill your baby boy by having faith in God and maintaining an active spirit with no complaint but serving others. So we see that the same principles take on a different shape when on a national course compared to the family course. And today we are on a world level course. So God's path to happiness is very challenging. But we will see that Moses and Jesus made a foundation for God to work through the second coming in this age. And we have tremendous hope. We'll learn more about this in the next session. Thanks for listening.